PI Perspectives. And welcome everybody to this week's episode of PI Perspectives. Before we jump into the program, we're going to welcome our friend Nikki McKinnell Marler from IRB back. Nikki, how are you? I'm doing great things. Thanks for having me on the show. I always love coming and being on the show. You're just extending the record for uh, most appearances here. I do what uh, I can. <laughs> so we are talking about IRB and you got some new stuff uh, on the horizon here. So tell me a little bit uh, about what's going on with IRB. We do. And I, I feel like every time I'm on here, of course, and then you get our emails and all that, we always have something new coming out. So just add this one to the list. Um, our latest is Phone Finder. And I'll be honest, this is what I call the Cadillac of phone searches. Uh, it is absolutely incredible as a 98% hit rate. It is all the information that you need related to phone numbers. It's got reverse phone as well. So it really has everything that you need. It'll also give you a phone history. And of course, the contact information, it also scores the phone numbers. So it has, it, it really is. It is absolute top of the line. So what does that mean scores? Can you explain that to me? The, uh, which one is better? So it's, it's giving you a ranking of um, which phone number is most likely to be the one that you're looking for. Okay. Um, so how does that work off the platform um, as far as that search goes? How, do, how does the user find this particular search? You just go into the platform and we'll have a little notification that says new next to it. Um, you'll see a lot of different news on there because again, we keep <laughs> releasing things. Right. Um, but this is one of them that has new next to it. And you just click on there, go in there, put in name, um, city, state, probably that's the best way to look up what you've got and then see what comes up for you. But of course, if you're having trouble with it, reach out to us, happy to, to help you walk through it, um, see what we can do to help you with your case. Okay. And for any uh, listeners here that aren't using IRB, um, you've got some, some promotions going on with, uh, with, with the show here. So I do. Me. Yes. We have a, a um, for your listeners, we have 100 free credits and a two week free trial for new and returning customers. And this is um, PIP 2021. So it's PI perspectives. So that's from, so PIP 2021 and go ahead and just put that in on the application when you go online and uh, we'll make sure that you get those extra credits. Yeah. And there's and links they, in, the, in the show notes actually where you can. Oh, the link. Okay, great. Yeah. IRBsearch.com. Right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about training because you guys are doing some lunch and learns too. So tell me a little bit about that. We are. Yeah. So in, I mean, everything is virtual these days and we've always had free training for clients and then also people who are not our clients. We just want to make sure that everyone in the industry has the information that they need. Um, so we have started a new training as well. We have free lunch and learns. Um, so these are going to be twice a month. And we had our first one last week, I believe it was really successful. Um, we've got advanced skip tracing tips. We have one coming up that's focusing on asset searches, um, business investigations. Um, so they're really getting in depth. They're giving you those pro tips um, to make sure that you have exactly what you need to, to solve your cases. Awesome. Well, Nikki, thanks for uh, jumping on once again <laughs> and saying hello. Um, and uh, I encourage folks to check out IRB um, and, and even check out the sister company, Del Point. Um, just a great, great databases. They're part of my arsenal, part of my toolbox uh, of searches. Uh, and they, they've quickly run up the uh, chain of uh, my most relied upon phone searches. I, I thought your phone searches actually were great already. So now I'm looking forward to seeing the Cadillac at work here. So uh, yeah, definitely give it a try. And the, the two for IRB and Dell point, they really do complement each other well, because they are different data sets. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to make sure that we could bring all of the best information to the market, uh, regardless of what contracts are and all of that. So IRB and Dell point, make sure that those are part of your waterfall. Awesome. Okay. So let's jump into the show and Nikki, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Welcome to PI Perspectives. Industry veteran Mike Dorez returns to the program today. Mike was part of the Investigators Roundtable episode last October. He's back today to discuss the benefits of outsourcing your skip tracing work. We also chat about no hit, no fees, and some pretexting tips. So let's jump right in and catch up with the guys. Please welcome Mike Dorez and your host, private investigator Matt Spare. And welcome everybody to this week's episode of PI Perspectives. This is your host, Matt Spear. Uh, I'm very honored to welcome back one of our roundtable uh, uh, attendees from back in October, uh, Mike Doris from Merlin, Lo Merlin Locate Services. Uh, Mike, welcome back to the program. How are you? 
Good to be back. Thanks. We're great. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Uh, you know, so we haven't talked since October. Uh, and folks actually, um, some some folks may actually not know who you are and what you've done, and you've got a really interesting backstory. So uh, let's cover that again real quickly. Tell me a little bit about um, you know how you got into the business, what you're doing, and and how you got to Merlin Locate Services today. Okay. Well, I started off. I was a process server. Uh, put myself through college as a process server, um, and uh, when I was actually just about to get my degree in college. Uh, which was in 1969, I believe, um, I ended up deciding I didn't want to be a speech pathologist and went to work for one of the companies that I had been process serving for as their manager of process, uh, which essentially is the dispatcher in-house, right. the guy that puts the work out into the field. I'm super and, curious. Uh, what what yeah. did uh, what did process serving look like in 1969? How did you do it? Did well, you phone book stuff uh, or what? If you've ever seen um, uh, Repo Man, you know that movie. Yeah, Repo sure. Man? Yeah, it was a lot like Repo Man. You know, you had some really good professional process servers, but then some guys that were who knew where they came from or why they right. were serving process, um, and you know they would show up uh, at about. Well, first of all, you'd have a team. I was at a big attorney service. Uh, right. We had about 15 people that would visit law offices every morning, pick up all the work that needed to be um, filed and served, and uh, bring it into our office by about 11 o'clock. And then everybody would be furiously um, sorting down the work to get it out to the courts or over to me to set up to put out for process. Right. And I would put the work together. I would look at it to make sure I had all the documents were correct, uh, staple everything together, put a proof of service on top of it, and assign it to a, a guy uh, who would go out and serve, guys right. and women. So um, what, what did you do um, with folks serving in Vietnam at the time? If, if people were serving in Vietnam? Yeah, what, what would be the, the process at that particular point? Uh, to get them served? Yeah. You know, I can't remember um, having <laughs> Sorry. that situation. That's a good question. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think we got those jobs. Essentially, right. we were working jobs, uh, serving summons and complaints, serving subpoenas in the field all day long. Right. Um, and I learned a lot about the, about the legal world and about legal documents. Sure. And I decided I didn't want to do it anymore because I would, being the manager of a process serving company, uh, especially when you're in charge of the servers, you've got the servers on one side who, who a lot of them are fairly crazy. You've got attorneys on the other side, and then you've got all the people you're serving in the yeah. middle of it all. Yeah. And it drove me nuts. And after wow. about five years of doing that, I believe, you know, it, so, it was not as crazy. So I can say like, you know, Imagine trying to do this work with no cell phone, no pager, no email, no Nothing. none of that, right? It's all no, uh, no, we had copies, right? At one point. That was quite <laughs> helpful. We maybe, uh, got... right, y'all got radios, right? So maybe like carbon copies if you're lucky, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'd have to go pick up the documents that needed to get served. There was no fax machines either when we wow. when I started, so that's pretty amazing. It was, it was pretty crazy, uh. Uh, I went to the owners of the company and I said, I'm going to start a skip tracing company from my house and I want you to be my first client because we were getting 30 to 40 bad addresses in a day at our office. Right. And we'd send them back to our clients and say, we can't serve this because it's a bad address. And, I, and they would send it out to an investigator. And so I literally started my company by representing myself as Mike from the attorney service and everybody knew me, all the clients knew me because I was the guy they called when there was a problem with the service, and right. et cetera. And uh, I taught myself how to locate people. I really had no training. I had nobody to go to to find out. I just figured it out. And because um, I had a ready base and because serving, uh, finding people uh, who are going to be served is not the hardest job. A lot of these people just moved. Um, right. They're not hiding. Um, so I learned how to do the. I learned how to do them all by learning with the easy ones. Right. Um, so I became a uh, skip tracer and on skip tracer for several years, and then decided 
that I don't want to be a skip tracer anymore. And I moved to Ojai, California, which is a little town. Um, I taught my dad how to skip trace and he ran my skip tracing company. Uh, I left and helped him out if he had a question. Um, and I moved to Ojai, California and bought a, a coffee bean and tea and cheese store from my aunt and uncle and did that for about three years, made wow. no money um, and basically spent every dime I, I could put together right. and then went back into the uh, skip tracing business. Um, and then I started uh, figuring out, I bought a phone disc in about 1990, 89, maybe 90. I bought a phone disc, which was the very first national uh, phone directory on CD-ROM. Right. Two thousand dollars it cost. Wow. And I was blown away because there's there was no place to find phone numbers for a national phone directory. And right. it had a lot of unlisted phone numbers in it, as it turns out, because they were getting their data from not from the phone company and phone books. They were getting it from all kinds of sources. Well, wow. so I, I saw this product and I said, I could sell this. And my wife was a salesperson. And so I started selling the phone disc. I became a, a, a reseller of the phone disc. Right. And uh, it was quite an experience because most yeah. PIs didn't even know what a CD-ROM drive was at that point. Were you the- they, uh, You had to go buy one at, at, right. at the uh, Andy, you know. Right. Were you the only one that was doing that at that particular time? Oh yeah. There was nobody, um, nobody else was making CD-ROMs at that point for PIs. Right. Um, and we sold a ton of phone discs. We sold a lot of them. And then um, I decided I was going to sell my PI business because I was running the PI business at the same time. My skip tracing business, I had two or three people working for me. And um, I decided I'm going to sell this business. It's making some decent money because I want to go full time into producing my own CD-ROMs that have California public record on it. Right. Uh, I figured out that I could do that. And uh, the first guy that I met who wanted to buy my company, when I told him my idea about the CD-ROMs, he said, I will do that with you. <laughs> I don't want to, I'll invest in your company. <laughs> right. And I said, well, that's great. And he literally wrote me a check for $50,000 on an idea that's and amazing. bought 15% of Merlin Information Services. Wow. Um, and I went into business selling CD-ROMs and making CD-ROMs. In 97, um, we went online with our first website uh, where we could now sell access to our data on a per search basis because the CD-ROMs were all uh, subscriptions to like California corporations or UCC filings or fictitious business names, property records. We had about 13 different California disks. Wow. Um, and in 97, we went online and I started building national databases at that point. Um, I became a reseller. I was one of the first resellers of Accurant, yep. um, which was quite helpful, right in the face of IRB too at the same time. Um, and, and, and the owner of IRB was the brother-in-law of Hank Asher, who was the owner of- Oh, of I didn't Ac realize it was a brother-in-law. Wow, that's, that's interesting. Well, he was one of them. There were three owners and, and right. uh, one of them was the brother-in-law. But I think Hank was mad at his brother-in-law that day that I showed up. To become <laughs> Hank a was mad at everybody. <laughs> well, on and off. And he made me a reseller, which wow. really pissed off the IRB guys. And I became yeah. a reseller of IRB along with all our California data. Yeah. Um, we called our product Link to America. We, we used the IRB feed or the um, Accurant feed yeah. um, at that point. In fact, yeah, it was Accurant. And... Um, did that for several years until Hank got mad at us and shut us off. <laughs> and I had to become a, um, I became a reseller of Choice Point at that point, yeah. built our own product to compete with, with IRB and Accurant. Um, never, I can say right now that we were never as good as their people search, their yeah. comp report. Um, we were close, but because we had so much California data, we yeah. kept our customer base and, and kept growing. So, uh, so in 2008, we well, lost about 40% of our business in about a month. Yeah. Um, many of our California customers were government agencies in California. 
Yeah. Um, when did when did Hank launch his uh, last one? Oh, uh, what, what year would that have been? Maybe 2004, something like that. Okay. 2005, 2006. I can't, yeah. I can't remember now exactly, but uh, we, we were, uh, we were, um, now it would have been later. It was probably 2010, I think. I, I want to say it was probably later because, because like yeah. on my end of it, right. So I got into this industry in, in 2001 and uh, I was working in house for an attorney, but I was a licensed PI. And I remember, I remember like PI magazine and seeing the wizard I'm like, Oh, Merlin, right. I'm going to try this out. Right. So I actually had Merlin and IRB. I had both of them. And then when, uh, TLO came out, I, I, I migrated over to that. And I was like one of their earlier customers. And I want to say it was, is probably around 2010, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just I ended up gravitating away. I think from Merlin, I, I was running, I was running IRB and and TLO for for a bit, um, but uh, yeah, I always I always felt even back then before I really grew my business because I, I started my own business in two thousand five. I, I always knew I needed more than one, um, you know, where I was sourcing data from. And then like when I was introduced to you last year. They're like, oh yeah, Mike Mike Dorr is from Merlin. I was like, the Merlin, right? <laughs> like, yeah, the Merlin. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, I was I was a user. <laughs> like, I had an account, and I yeah. I liked it. There was another one um, that I had, Locate Plus. Also, that was another one I think I used. Uh, they had a lot of problems. I didn't like them that much. Problems. Yeah, 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 I didn't like it. They um, did a good, they did a good job, but they got in trouble. Um, you know, securities problems in Massachusetts selling stock in their company. That yeah, I, I, I know just at, at one point, like it, it was good, but then it just was not good anymore. And, yeah. uh, you know, I made the decision to make the move. And, uh, you know, when, uh, when I was spending the attorney's money, it didn't really matter, you know, you just get what you need, you know, <laughs> do whatever you need to do. But you know, when it's your own business, and you're starting up, it's like, okay, I gotta, you know, I gotta look at my budget here. Um, Absolutely. So um, now you you've uh, come f full circle here, and you're running Merlin Locate Services. Um, well, so we tell me sold uh, the yeah, Merlin me. company, Merlin Data Publishing, in 2012, mm -hmm. um, in the face of just about going out of business, literally. And the company that bought us um, ended up merging what was left of Merlin with TLO. Right. Um, and that was a, a interesting time because uh, Hank was now my boss. Right. <laughs> I was now, and, but Hank and I were buddies. Uh, Hank yeah. always called me a founder and it really treated me quite, quite well. There was a few times he got mad at me and shut us yeah. off and all that. But uh, at the end, especially, um, he was very respectful and actually understood that I, I knew what I was talking about and I knew data. Uh, Hank would call me at four in the morning sometimes, literally. You know, they were having all kinds of problems at one point where their database had, had literally become trashed. Um, and um, I think they're still fixing some of those problems yeah, today. He possible. could not figure it out. He couldn't yeah. fix it. And it was driving him nuts. Yeah. And he would literally wake up my house to talk to me <laughs> just about how how... And he would be crying on the phone, literally telling yeah. me that I can't fix this problem. It's driving me crazy. So we got to be pretty good buddies, uh, but he was not capable of really running that business uh, at, at the end when I was there. Yeah. And yeah. Um, months after my, my company got merged with his, they filed bankruptcy um, and um, and got sold to, to TransUnion. Yeah, TransUnion came out. I and all of my employees got fired because we were now employees of TLO. Right. And, um, and uh, that was the end of that. And I opened up a skip tracing company with all the people that were left at Merlin at that point. Right. Uh, all the tech guys got jobs. That was not an issue. Uh, but all the customer service people and the sales people that were left and skip tracers, because we had a skip tracing department at right. Rowan Data Publishing as well, opened a skip tracing company. I had 15 full-time people uh, right off the bat, and we were doing high volume place of employment locates, mostly for debt buyers, where right. we could 5,000, 10,000 jobs at a time. Yeah. We'd run the jobs through databases, several databases, looking for clues, 
the jobs would then, um, and that was all automated. Yeah. The jobs would then hit the, the researchers' desks and we would verify the leads that came up in the um, in the database searches. Yeah. And after about three or four years of really literally finding out that debt buyers are much smarter than I am when it comes to <laughs> how do you price a job and how do you get your vendor to do all the work and make no money. Right. Um, we fired the most of the debt buyer clients and most of the researchers. I kept my best skip tracers and my best clients. And since then, it's been about five years now, it's yeah. been a, a good business because we're working for people that aren't trying to rip us off. Yeah. Um, about half our clients are PIs uh, and attorneys. Yeah. Um, we still have a lot of collection attorneys that uh, send us work. Sure. And we're a strictly a skip tracing and place of employment location company. Yeah, you, can, you guys do fantastic work. All right, so we're gonna jump out and take a, a break real quick. And then when we come back in, there, there are some talking points, uh, some things we wanna talk about. That whole idea of, of outsourcing your skip, skip tracing, I wanted to talk about that. Um, we're gonna get into some due diligence. We're even gonna touch a little bit on pretexting um, and talk about it. So before we get into all that stuff, I just wanna remind everybody, Mike and I are not attorneys. Uh, we, we're not offering legal advice. We're just a couple of guys that, that do this type of research work that have opinions about things. So please, if you have any questions or anything like that, consult an attorney. Don't don't call Matt. Don't call Mike. Uh, we're just giving you, giving you our two cents on this thing. So everybody sit tight and we'll be right back. Are you overwhelmed with your current case log? Could you use some help with your skip trace assignments? With Merlin Locate Services, rather than adding staff, you can add an entire skip trace department of licensed private investigators who specialize in skip tracing. Check out MerlinLocate.com today. When you work with Merlin Locate Services, you bring on a valuable experience and trusted extension to your team. Cross Tracks Case Management System, that is what we are talking about today. Are you using a case management system? What are you waiting for? If you don't use a case management system, you really need to look into implementing that into your business regimen. I've been at it with Crosstrax now a little over a year, and it's just been a game changer for my business. They are SOC 2 certified, SOC 2 Type 2 certified. If you don't know what that means, it means that their encryption system is second to none. And you have to go through a whole screening process to figure out uh, if you can even qualify for that, and they have. So you know with certainty your data is being protected. I don't think there's another case management system out there that offers that same ability to have the SOC 2 Type 2 certification. As you guys know, I've been uh, you know singing the praises of Crosstrax, and uh, I really believe in this product, and I believe you should check it out. Contact Brad, contact Pat, uh, one of the team members over there, and see if it's right for you. Cross tracks case management system. Check it out today. PI Perspectives. Check out the PI Institute of Education at piinstitute.com. Since 1989, Kelly Riddle has been teaching on subjects such as surveillance, nursing home investigations, insurance fraud, domestic investigations, hidden assets, and accident scene investigations. The PI Institute of Education is a featured learning partner in the investigatorstoolbox.com. So check out the free content on the site, then visit the Institute for more great savings on additional classes. Are you looking to build your investigation business and improve on your skills? Have you ever wanted a resource library that is fully customizable? Check out investigatorstoolbox.com. Hundreds of investigators have already joined this fantastic community. The Toolbox is the place to go for networking, continued education, and data resource management. Don't miss the discounts and benefits from all companies like Crosstrax, Delft Point, IRB, PI Magazine, PI Gear, the PI Institute of Education, and Cynthia Hetherington. Just 49 cents a day gets you access to this amazing site investigators-toolbox.com investigators-toolbox.com it's time to take your business and your training to the next level are you a member of intellinet don't miss the virtual conference on march 23rd through march 25th kicking off our conference will be keynote speaker michelle rigby assad 
author of Breaking Cover, My Secret Life in the CIA and what it taught me about what's worth fighting for. Educational training director Jeff Stein has planned another exceptional lineup of programs and speakers with at least 12 CEUs available for those that attend all sessions, plus a virtual escape room event for Wednesday evening. Once again, congrats to show guest Chris Salgado. Chris dons the latest cover of PI Magazine and highlights CyberPole. The issue is available today. And welcome back to PI Perspectives. This is Matt Sperry, your host. Uh, today, I am honored again to have Mike Doris uh, from Merlin Locate Services. Mike, welcome back to the program. How are you? Good. Thank you. All right. Awesome. So, uh, we touched on a little bit before the break about outsourcing and investigators that outsource uh, skip tracing work to you. And I, I really don't think people realize the benefits of it, uh, especially if you're a smaller shop and you're doing a lot of things. Um, you're doing a lot of field work, right? Like the attention to detail that you really need to do skip tracing work. I mean, you really have to make sure you're doing your your due diligence and you're really following the leads on the resources, right? The, the search that you're doing, the, whatever leads the resources are giving you, um, it takes time. And sometimes you don't have that time or you'll go and you'll check one source and you'll be like, okay, well, this is gospel. This address is good. Is it really though? Did you really like go through and check it? And um, I have found as being a smaller shop with field workers i have an excellent team of investigators and there's there's a bunch of research research work that they do that i completely trust and know they're doing but then there's other stuff where it's like okay now the time to call the Merlin people and get them in on this stuff uh, so tell me a little bit about that that experience so this managed services uh aspect to it this offering this skip tracing service what does that look like what who typically calls you to do this type of stuff well, in the investigative world, um, we have lots of, uh, of attorneys and uh, especially collection attorneys that use our service, some insurance companies, um, lots of debt buyers, so smaller debt buyers um, use us for skip tracing. But on the investigative side, um, it's mostly the smaller guys, the, the onesie twosie uh, offices, um, a lot of field guys that, uh, that don't skip trace. Um, or don't feel that they're excellent skip tracers. Uh, the, every job we get from an investigator has been worked before we get it. But uh, we don't expect you to just get in a nice new fresh job and send it to us. Right. Um, and that's just not how it works. Um, so you would think that our hit rate's gonna be fairly low and how could we really do the job because you're gonna pick off all the easy ones. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that um, while we have access to databases that likely you don't, because just for instance, clear, the Thomson Reuters clear product is probably the best database that we have right. uh, for a single source. If you had to have a single source and you could afford clear, which is like a thousand dollars a month minimum, I think, uh, yeah. for uh, access to clear, um, that would be the one that I would pick. Yeah. Um, but we have, we have, basically all of them, because we have enough volume and there's enough differences between them that we have the advantage of being able to look in many places um, to find what we're looking for. Right. At the same time, I would say that 50% of our locates are, are found not from the databases, but from social media, from just getting people on the phone and getting yeah. them to tell you stuff that they might not tell you otherwise if yeah. they knew exactly who you were. Um, That's what I love about your team. Uh, yeah, they really, them. really are good at doing that. Uh, yeah. you know, the, the, the um, not the soft skills, the hard skills, you know, the, the picking up the phone and knowing the right way. And, and I've had conversations with your team, like, hey, this is a situation here, like you gotta kids gloves, like we gotta be really careful how we do this stuff. And delicately getting me the information that I need. Uh, there was one that we did recently. This guy was evading service, right? So if we were, if we were, and he was a foreigner who sometimes was in New York, sometimes wasn't, right? And he had uh, this pro piece of property that he was trying to sell, you know? So being able to set up a situation where we knew we could get them to be at a certain location, right? Oh, I'm interested in, in leasing this property. Can you show it to me? Right. And delicately setting up that scenario. So 
amazing. You know, my client was like, how did you get this done? You know, and it's like, I got people, I got good people that, that do this there stuff. You go. Um, one of the other things that I really, really appreciate, uh, and I'm going to give a plug here. Um, you guys use Crosstrex in your case management system. So when I signed up to, to start doing work with you guys, I got the whole format of, you know, hey, this is Crosstrex, this is how we do it. And I was like, great, I use Crosstrex. I, this makes sense to me, right? I can uh, go ahead and, and do things. But the benefits of having a case management system like Crosstrex, um, where I'm now the client, right? <laughs> I don't sign in as the administrator, I sign in as, as the client. I get to see the, the back end stuff of what my clients actually see when I set cases up. But man, the back and forth with the notes and and um, you know getting updates and things like that i love it you know and you know your team is like they'll do certain things and they'll reach out to me for further instructions and we can go back and forth and i can make sure that they're doing it the way i need it done and my expectations are met and at the end of the day that's that's what's really important and yes there's a premium to it you know i am paying you a service to do this i'm making less money on my job because i'm paying a premium to, to have the, the job done, but it's getting done correctly. And at the end of the day, when you're dealing with attorneys, really getting the job done is more important than what the bottom line is, um, especially in New York anyways, because the, the expenses are all recoverable. So their, their retainer fee, their one third fee that they collect, they're getting that regardless of how much money they spend on the case. You know, like, so if they settle a case for $100,000, uh, just for example, they're, they're always going to get their $33,000 and they're going to recover their expenses on top of that. So, you know, investigative expenses, do what you need to do to get the job done. And that, that's kind of been my experience with it. Well, a lot of investigators don't pass on their costs either to their yeah. clients, which you have makes to. no sense because yeah, the client is not paying, the clients, their client's going to pay. Yeah. Um, and when we get an investigator uh, who sends us a job and uh, we tell them, well, the way we do our jobs is we charge a minimum for the first two hours. Right. And um, if uh, after two hours we can't locate somebody, but there are still open leads, we'll call our client and say, hey, here's, our, here's the leads that are open. Here's what we've done so far. Yeah. Um, we need you to authorize another hour. Yeah. Okay. And I've had clients, PI clients will say, uh, I don't. I don't have it in my budget. Well, call your client. And, exactly. And <laughs> Just make the phone call. So, so here's here's well, why you call your client because you you was like, hey, this is what we found so far. Oh, great! Mm -hmm. They're doing it. They're getting it done, and they mm -hmm. they got to understand that sometimes you know you pull on the thread, and the thread becomes a ball of yarn. <laughs> you got to keep pulling, right? So um, I, I've never had an experience where an attorney says, you know what, this is good. Just cut it here. Yeah, I mean, maybe that I happens on the defense them. side, but not on the plaintiff side ever. Never had that. Well, the, the problem really is that a lot of, of our PI clients are taking jobs online. They're advertising online and taking jobs from people. You know, when, when we get a job from you, we ask you, what's the purpose of the locate? Why right. are you looking for this person? And we wanna know exactly what's this case about and what, right. what's going on here. Right. And we'll have our PI client say to us, and this is more than one, I, I don't know why we're doing this. Well, what do you mean you don't know? You took a job and you don't even know? <laughs> what if this guy is gonna murder the guy that you're asking us to locate? You should know why. Well, they sent it to us, through the internet, and I haven't been able to contact them, but they authorized uh, $150. That's and, a problem. And, you know, and I, my attitude back at that point is, number one, we're not going to do that job because we won't do a job unless we know why. Mm -hmm. And we're assuming that because you're a PI, you're asking why. So if you're not asking why, I don't want the job. Yeah. And you're not charging enough. Yeah. Um, you shouldn't do that because by not charging enough, you're not being able to do the job right. Yeah. And that, you know, that was the other thing that I was very impressed with when I signed up to do work with you guys, your application process and your vetting of people that you're actually going to get in business with. Fantastic. You know, some people might be annoyed by that. I actually appreciate that, you know, cause I know that, you know, you're, you're following the guidelines and you're making sure that, you know, if the music stops, everybody's got a chair. 
and nobody's doing anything that he shouldn't be doing. Um, and that's, that is really, really important. So let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, something that's very uh, irksome, <laughs> bothersome, something that, that you scratch your head and go, why did you do that, right? The no charge, no found scenario. Uh, what's your opinion on that? And what do you, how, how do you feel about that situation? Well, it's definitely uh, migrated over the years. I started my business, uh, no charge, not found, um, because I was able, I had a ready customer base and I could call a, uh, an attorney and say, hey, it's Mike from the attorney service. This is a bad address uh, for $75. We can locate this guy. If we don't find him, it's no charge. Right. And I could get probably 75, 80% hit rate uh, doing that. So it wasn't costing me too much. And it was a, a no, no problem with the client approving a no charge if not found. Um, what I found over the years, especially when access to data became so cheap when the 25 cent search showed up and all of a sudden everybody, including my clients, the attorney clients were using this data first for me to do a no charge if not found made no sense yeah. because my hit rate was literally, well, all this data was now available. My hit rate's going down because my client is doing the work before I get it. Yep. So now a 50% hit rate is still excellent as long as I can show you exactly what I did and why I couldn't find the guy. Right. Um, and, um, and you couldn't make money with no charge if not found. And all it was doing was allowing somebody who really didn't know what he was doing, who wasn't going to survive in the business anyway, to right. um, interfere and take the work before I got it. Yeah. Um, and we stopped doing that several years ago. We, we charge on everything we do. So here's my feeling on this stuff, right? So I think the no charge of not found is is a situation that should live strictly in a database situation or an AI situation, right? If you're plugging numbers in and there's no real work that's involved other than just data entry and it comes back with no hit, I, I get it, okay? But if somebody's actually doing research and they're looking and they're they're taking the effort or making the effort to really research it and get you the answer you need. You can't expect people to work for free. Yeah, you know, I get this sometime with the attorneys. They're like, oh, well, if I lose a case, I don't get paid. Okay, yeah, but if you win a case, you get uh, one third of it. So let's not have that conversation, you know, like, you know, I, I get paid. For, like, I'm, I tell the attorneys this all the time, like, you don't pay for results. You just don't. You pay for service being done. You pay for my expertise, my domain knowledge of the 25 years experience I have doing this stuff. That's what you're paying for. You're not paying for whether or not, you know, I ran that plate and, and I found out who it was. No, you got to pay regardless, you know, for the research that gets done. And that's, that's my two cents, right? And again, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> so it's not legal advice. Yeah. Um, it, it, that's just my feeling on it. You know, I, I would never want somebody to expect me to work for free. And I think it's wrong for us to expect anybody who, who provides a service to work for free if they can't solve your problem. That's, uh, yeah, it's just not a good business model. So, and, yeah. you know, I think ne Alexis Nexus, um, you know, or the businesses that service the attorneys and they sell them these databases with the idea that they're getting a comprehensive search is criminal because they really, they're not, you know, I think, you know, whoever's doing the sales to these guys that sell them this idea that, you know, it's the same thing that we do as investigators, it's wrong. It, it's not even close to it, um, especially in New York. I mean, people moved every two months. It's, a, it's crazy. Uh, well, and no, no database is comprehensive and no database is right about everything. And, and uh, 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 the main thing that an investigator, it, I mean, we find people right at the address that the TLO says they're at. Um, and the server goes out and the server says they don't live there anymore. So the job comes back to us and we re-verify. We yeah. talk to the landlord. We talk to the next door neighbor. Yeah, yeah, that guy definitely lives there. So now we go back with the description and a car and what time yeah. to go get the guy and they go get the guy. Yeah. And it's the methodology behind it, right? So that, you know, that's something we had talked about earlier, right? So it's, it's more than just, you know, typing some numbers into, um, you know, resources and there are tons of resources out there. I mean, thousands, thousands of resources out there that you can use to use your research. Some are paid, some are free, but the hard skills, you need those hard skills to learn how to make phone calls, to learn how to follow up 
and ask the right questions and really frame the situation where you're going to get the answer that you're looking for. Um, it, it's, it's a skill that not everybody has. And when you find somebody who's good at doing that, you farm your workout, you make less on it and, uh, you know, you mark it up accordingly and, uh, keep it moving. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room here. Uh, cause I think we're moving in that direction anyways, with, with pretexting. Um, and, uh, yeah, we had talked earlier before we, we got online about this with the FDPCA. So tell me a little bit about your opinion on this stuff. And again, folks, this is not legal advice. Mike is not an attorney. I'm not an attorney. We're just spitballing over here on, uh, on this idea. So, uh, okay. Let's have it. Well, I don't believe that. The, all right, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe that there are any laws that say that we can't pretext. Okay, um, we're not breaking the law if we um, talk to somebody on the phone to get something from them and they don't know exactly why we're calling. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that there, that there's any laws that say we can't do that. Um, but there, there is a law called the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, uh, FDCPA, um, which says that if you're collecting a debt, um, that you are not allowed to lie to somebody. You, can, you have to identify who you are, you have to identify that you're collecting a debt, um, and you have to only tell the truth. And you can't threaten them with anything unless you're gonna do it either. That's part of the FDCPA. Can't right. say, well, we're going to sue you if you don't pay, and then you don't <laughs> sue them. It's right. a lot to do that, as it turns right. out. Um, and we have, because we spent quite a lot of time and still have a lot of jobs of uh, locating people who are debtors, mm -hmm. um, we follow the FDCPA even though we're not collecting a debt. We're locating contact information. And it's very specific in the FDCPA and in the Fair Credit Reporting Act that it's okay to, um, there's, no, there's no restrictions to what you have to do to locate somebody, okay? Right. Um, but if we get the subject on the phone and we say, and we lie to the subject in a debtor situation, make up a story, okay? Um, we would be putting our client in jeopardy of being a foul of the FDCPA uh, because you, uh, an attorney or a collector can't hire someone else to do something they're not allowed to do. Okay. Exactly. So we, even though we wouldn't get in trouble as, col as locators, um, they can't go after us. We didn't break any rules, but our client would get in trouble. Yeah. And they could have a file, an action filed against them uh, under the FDCPA. So, so you bring up a good point here. And there is opinion in New York um, with regards to this. So it's not a law. It's, it's opinion. It's written by the, the New York State Bar Association. And essentially what that opinion states is investigators are an extension of attorney's office. So if an attorney is hiring you to locate a defendant, um, you know, for good service or anything like that, you're actually a representative of the plaintiff and you're bound by the same restrictions and regulations that that plaintiff attorney is bound by as an attorney. So you're essentially an agent of the attorney and you got to follow the same rules. So ethics wise, there's not supposed to be contact. You know, you, if someone is represented by, by counsel, um, or, you know, let's say it's a motor vehicle accident and they have an insurance carrier that's been involved. They've been notified that their insured hasn't been involved in an accident. They're kind of represented. You really shouldn't be talking to them. You know, if somebody is an employee of a municipality and there's a, you know, a slip and fall or trip and fall, like they're an employee of the defendant. You really should not be having interaction with them. You know, Facebook, you know, social media, you know, you can't create that fake profile and it, it, I, I get i get like schemed out man when i'm talking to other investigators and they're like oh well i got 20 different profiles that i use as needed you know to do this stuff i'm just like eh, great area man yeah. like be very careful i'm not saying you can't do it i'm just saying i wouldn't do it you know when i reach out to people it's hey i am an investigator i'm hired by so-and-so attorney who's representing xyz 
we understand you witnessed the accident or whatever, we would really like to talk to you. Please contact me at your earliest convenience, right? And a lot of times in, in, the, in the personal injury field, like people want to insert themselves in the narrative. They want to talk about what they saw. So the odds of them contacting you are usually pretty good um, for doing this stuff. But I don't know, opinion wise, ethics wise, I don't do it. I don't have any of my people do it. Don't create fake accounts. I think it's uh, it's a slippery slope that you can't come back from. Sure. Um, well, you'll notice. So when you send us a job uh, in the application uh, to to assign the job to us, we ask you: Is this a collection of a debt? And um, is this is this individual uh, represented by counsel? Yeah. And the reason we ask you that is because we don't want to talk to the subject if they are uh, represented and we will not talk to the subject. Um, and our rule has always been um, as far as a pretext and a pretext basically is making up a story to get somebody to tell you something basically. Right. Um, that any time that you can just tell the truth, who you are, what your phone number yeah. is, why you're calling, just do it. And it's a hundred percent right. A hundred percent of the time, the truth is, is going to be the same. You know? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, everybody has uh, their own theory of what's the gray area, et cetera. Uh, I can tell you absolutely. Um, and you had an article in the toolbox uh, a couple of weeks ago from, I think, Eldorado Insurance wrote an yes. article about, uh, about pretexting. Um, it, it was kind of uh, bland and vanilla, but it was right. Uh, don't represent yourself as law enforcement, for instance. Uh, yeah, that's a yeah. very bad thing. That's a big no-no. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you don't, we, we have a rule in my company called uh, don't leave trash. And the, and the leaving trash, which of course, everybody in my company has a different opinion of what leaving trash actually is. But for instance, um, I was working for a company called Amfac Thrift and Loan. That's the first place I was. A, I was a collector at mm -hmm. Amfac Thrift and Loan. I was about 20 years old. And uh, the collector next to me, I heard him talking to the mother of a debtor, trying to find out where he was. And, uh, and he represented himself as being from the city of Los Angeles uh, Health Department and that he was doing a gonorrhea screening. Oof. And he needed to contact <laughs> the subject in Sounds order painful. to let him know that he may very well have gonorrhea <laughs> and um, and that he should be checked. Right. Um, somehow, and I don't know exactly how, uh, they figured it out. The the people that he that he gagged uh, figured it out, sued Amfac Thrift and Loan, and immediately got like $10,000. Yeah. And this was probably 1972, so that was a lot of money. Yeah, the guy got fired. Running wild back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah well, <laughs> Um, there was no rules, no, you know, and, yeah. and my boss, who was one of the best bosses, and I, I learned more from, from this guy, his name was Dick Young uh, at Amfac Thrift and Loan. I learned a lot from him, sure. um, but he, even he was aghast <laughs> yeah. when he heard about this, but then they got in trouble. And basically, when you, if you're going to talk to somebody who's, uh, where you're just trying to find out, does so-and-so live next door? Is, mm. is, is the standard gag because we're trying to verify an address. Mm. But, and we don't want to tell the neighbor that the guy next door may be, uh, is a subject of a lawsuit. Mm. Um, so we might make up a little story for why we're calling. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we don't want to make up a story that's going to terrorize people. That's no, going to leave them freaked out, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, um, put it in, in, to, in today's times, right? You call the neighbor and saying, oh, uh, you know, th this person may have been, uh, may have COVID. <laughs> you know, like it may have been yeah, infected with yeah, COVID. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, like, that'd you, be a horrible You can't do that. <laughs> you so, cannot uh, do that. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a touchy area. Every investigator has to, uh, for themselves, decide, well, how far am I going to yeah. go here? I teach everybody that I've ever taught skip tracing, and there's hundreds of them over the years, uh, just be nice when you're on the phone, especially yeah. to court clerks. Oh, definitely. You know, they're harassed clerks. all day long. You yeah. know? And if you approach them nicely, hey, I, I need some help here. Can you help me? A lot of times they'll stop what they're doing and they'll go and run a search for you and tell yeah. you what they find. Yeah. When I, when I was working for the attorney before I started my own business, I learned that very early on that, you know, the, the folks that, um, that you, that you're, 
submitting papers for filing to uh, like uh, request for judicial intervention, notice of motions, things like that. Like sometimes there'd be like a piece of paper missing or wasn't in the right order or something like that. And, and if you were nice to them, they wouldn't make you get offline. They'd just let you rearrange anything, you know, but if you were, you know, aggressive with them, they throw you out of the building. No, I'm sorry. You know, this isn't correct. You got to go back and fix it, you know, um, or this isn't signed here. You know, you forgot to sign this here. I'm sorry. You, you can't file this today. Yeah. And I remember there was this one guy in the subpoena room and he was just this angry dude, super angry all the time, Urgh, you know, like I'll never forget him. And I just started like being super nice to him. And, you know, I, I, I figured out something that he liked. I think it was like Star Trek or something like that. And I just started talking about Star Trek, <laughs> which I have a very limited knowledge of Star Trek. But hey, what the heck, right? And it got to the point where he was retiring. And I was kind of bummed out that he was retiring because I had developed this rapport with him where I didn't have to wait if I needed something, you know, if I needed to get files somewhere, you know, hey, Matt, what's up? I got you. You know, I'll take care of it. You know, and then there were other people that like I went to school with, right? So I'm uh, online one day and I see the guy's got the college ring on. So I was like, oh, I'm class of 95. You know, where, where do you, you know, when'd you graduate? You know, it looks like, oh, I see 93 there. Like, we, you know, I may have, you know, maybe we saw each other or whatever, or maybe you were back at school at one point. You know, and you, you developed that rapport, right? Um, so I had that happen too. Um, and always just being super kind to people. There was this one lady I remember too, she was always very grumpy and I would always like crack a joke when I saw her and, and I won her over eventually, you know, she just couldn't hate me. <laughs> just go in and be goofy, right. Right. you know, but you learn it's well, all psychology, well, man. Yeah. When I ran the uh, process serving business, uh, we would have these rush filings where they have to be filed today, you know, yeah where there was no way we were going to get to the court in time, you know, with traffic and everything else. And we'd call the clerk that we knew. They'd meet us at the door. They'd unlock the door yeah. for us and bring it in and file. Yeah. And that was because we treated them nicely when we were waiting in line all day long, uh, you know, to, oh. uh, to get papers to file. Yeah. And I think that brings it back to the argument of why you charge what you charge, right? Your clients are paying for those relationships. They're paying for your ability to to get that stuff done um, because it is, you know, part of what we do. You know, it's it's that that ability to develop relationships. You know, you're as good as the people that you know. You know, especially you know if you're an investigator, you can't possibly know everything or do anything. You know, this is a relationship based business. Uh, and you get results by knowing people and, and being good to people and, and, and being ethical and developing that reputation of somebody who does things by the book, who has that, you know, sheet that you fill out to make sure that um, when you're doing the work, you're doing it the, the right way. Because, again, when things get questioned and you have to, you know, now connect the dots, it's very easy. And that's the other thing that I really love with you guys. The reports that you generate um, are very thorough. It is never a question of how did you get that information? I know that, uh, you know, when I'm submitting something to you guys, the report I'm going to get back, it's something that is admissible in court without question, um, you know, within those guidelines. And it's not only is it admissible, it'll hold up. It's really hard to question, you know, the, the work there. So uh, we're going to wind down over here. But folks, I really strongly uh, encourage you, if you're, fitting that criteria of maybe you're overloaded with the work that you're doing and um you know you, you don't think you're you're hitting the marks on your due diligence research um call mike and his team and 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 at least talk to them and figure out if it's something that makes sense for you um i started doing it uh, a while back and uh I, i've i'm sending a lot of work their way because at the end of the day just the, the results that they're getting um I'm very satisfied with. And it's not even a matter of, oh, you found my person. It's the fact that I know that they're doing everything possible they can to get the right information. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's important. It's just as important as finding that particular subject. It's how you found them uh, or, or the, the uh, attempts that you made to find them. What what methodology did you find? So, uh, Mike, if folks want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? Um. Personally, you can reach me at mike at mdiverify.com. Um, our website is merlinlocate.com. Um, everything you need to know about us is there as well. 
Um, there's a contact form in the, at our website. Um, so, or you can just call me. Uh, well, I don't know if I should give you my cell phone number or not. I'm happy to have it out there. It's not a secret. Uh, it's online probably in about 40 different places. Yeah, so, I think uh, the skip tracers can find it out there. <laughs> yeah. And if they can't, they need to call Merlin. <laughs> yeah, but just call, or yeah, just call yeah. Mike at, or uh, email me, Mike at mdiverify.com and um, I'll get right back to you. Awesome. So Mike, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and thank you for everything you've done for this industry. Um, you know, uh, you are one of the founders. That's something we had talked about earlier. Um, I, I think this type of work, um, you definitely had a, uh, a say in how things are, are done and the methodology of doing things. So thanks for coming on. It was great chatting with you. I'm sure we'll talk to you again at some point, but uh, thank you for what you do. And thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll catch everybody next week on the next show. These guys could have easily kept going because Mike has such a rich history in this industry. We want to thank him for joining us today. Please consider using Merlin Locate Services if you need help on your assignments. They're a big supporter of this show and Investigator's Toolbox. We also want to thank Crosstracks, IRB, and the PI Institute for Education for sponsoring this show. Don't forget to check out InvestigatorsToolbox.com. Remember, it only takes 49 cents a day to unlock the future of investigations. So make an investment in your business and yourself today. And you can save $20 when you use code PIP201836. If you have a question or comment about the show, email Matt at MatthewS at SatelliteDI.com. And you can also find them on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. We'd like your feedback to bring you the best shows possible. We'll be back next Monday with a new show, so make sure you tune in. And please stay safe out there.